Chris McGomert. Thank you all for coming. I'm Chris Putnam, city councilman here in Colleyville. This is my house. Welcome to Colleyville. We call it Collywood. Certainly that's appropriate tonight. We've got a lot of celebrities here. Um, I'm going to get right to it because we're behind tonight. I think everybody knows this next guy, right? So, TheBlaze.com, the radio show, the TV show. I'm a kid of the 80s who got into conservative politics, listened to David Gold and Pat Buchanan. So this is super exciting for me to have somebody here of his stature. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Beck. Thank you. And thank you, Chris, for the generous use of your house. And, Louie, I just want to go on record. You are... You are crazier than I am. And I think you just proved that. Um, uh, thank you so much for being here, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for being a group of people that actually stand for principles. It is growing increasingly amazing to me how many people we have stood with over the last eight, nine, ten years uh, that have just put winning at the top of their list instead of the Constitution and our principles. Instead of putting our God and our principles uh, at the forefront. It is really amazing to me that we have come to a place to where we don't, we have been beaten up so badly. We have been told that we can't win, that we're wrong, and we have been humiliated and laughed at for so long that we now seem to not even have faith in our own principles and in the God Almighty that leads us. Don't give up. Don't get uh, weary from the fight. This is not our fight. These are not our rights. Those rights belong to the Almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Stand where you're supposed to stand and expect Him to part the seas. I want to, uh, I want to start with something I, that actually um, uh, I... I was writing a, a note to David Barton um, because David and I went to a, a Passover uh, Seder last night. And that's crazy. I mean, it, it lasts forever. And uh, uh, we started at 7 and it was about 2 o'clock and we both went, gee, we got to go. And they're like, but there's more. <laughs> My pillow is calling to me. But it was amazing. It was amazing because it was all about, it was Everything you did was about the story of leaving Israel it, or, or Egypt. It, everything was a ritual to teach the children. So David and I are sitting there the whole time. We're like, this is the problem. The problem is we don't have any rituals anymore. We don't even know our own story anymore. So today on the way over here, and I just wanted to start with this. Um, on the way over here, I just wrote David a quick note. He was, he was writing me something from last night, and I said, David, we need rituals. They were in our lives at one time for a reason. But the past, they now tell us, has nothing to teach us now. That is truly the problem in our country. The ritual of our church is gone. It is conformed to the world. The silence and reflection has been replaced with lights, bands, and fog machines. The respect of the sacred is gone. It has conformed. Our music is filled with sex. Our radio stations are the same. Our schools no longer deal with the kids that are, that are worried about a smoke bomb in the bathroom, but instead they're having to deal with the kids who are having oral sex, which, by the way, they will tell you is not really sex. And even if it was sex, that doesn't matter either because sex is no longer a sacred bond between you, the other, and the Almighty God. The ritual of our family meals at night every day is gone. The sacredness of the family is mocked. Mom is okay, but mom's only okay as long as she has a career that she puts ahead of her children and her family. And by the way, that's only okay as long as she doesn't really need a man. And men have been mocked and ridiculed and told that men have to be more like women. And we wonder why so many children don't have fathers. But we've learned here recently that you actually don't need a man or a woman. You don't need a mother or a father. We can just take the DNA of three different people, work it up in a Petri dish, and now we can even plant it in grandma's womb so grandma can carry your child. And by the way, this is so you, your partner, 
or same sex, traditional or single, can have a child. And as I wrote that, I followed it with, can have a child. Not raise a child, not shepherd a child, not care for a child, but our society has grown so self-centered, we all talk about having a child. We are told now that there are 89 different sexes. I only know two. I don't know about you guys. Everyone now can use a bathroom, depending on how you feel that day. Perhaps today you might feel gender fluid, but I know that we are certainly common sense fluid. Yeah. Our TV shows encourage youth now to experiment. But I thought when we said that that was what was coming, the left told us, no, no, no. That's a choice. They don't have any choice. They're not doing it because they want to. It's a choice, but now we're told it's not a choice. You can choose to experiment and be whatever you want. Even the way God made you isn't sacred anymore. But maybe that began when we started to cut our faces up to look like someone else, someone with a better nose, maybe younger, maybe famous. Our body is a temple, not anymore, not unless you can poison it, degrade it, or deface it. David, I miss my childhood in many ways. I miss when the worst we could do is get caught with a pack of cigarettes. When my dad made me walk half a mile back to the grocery store on the corner because I had innocently just picked up a piece of bazooka bubble gum and I didn't tell him when we were checking out and he made me walk back with him to give the cashier that penny. I miss the comics in gum and a time when gun smoke or the wild wild west was still relevant and still real and maybe perhaps a little, miss, a little edgy because God only knows what Miss Kitty was doing upstairs. <laughs> but those days seemed to be gone. Family hour was ruled unconstitutional. The Sunday driver, my kids don't even know what it means because they've never even heard of the blue laws. And while I agree with the courts on those two particular cases, maybe there was something to them because that was holding our society together. The ritual of getting together with loved ones and grandparents on Sunday is now... Oh, shoot. It just... I lost battery. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Good thing I printed it. Hang on just a second. The, the, uh, rituals of, uh, the ritual of getting together with loved ones and grandparents on Sunday, even the rituals of our grandmothers actually looking like a grandmother now is gone. I remember my grandmother having gray hair and white hair. I don't know a single grandma who has that anymore. We no longer have meaningful rituals of 4th of July. It's about booze, about James Brown and Bruce Springsteen songs, and hot dogs. Easter is about egg hunts. Thanksgiving is about turkey and football. Christmas is about Santa. The truth is gone, justice is a joke, and no one even cares what the American way even is anymore. Hope? Hope? Where does that come from? And that's when I was pulling into the driveway. And I realized, that's what I'm here for. That's what I've brought with me. What I brought with me is hope. Because I finished it with, I guess, David, the answer is remembering who we really are, not the people we've allowed ourselves to become. Our society isn't screwed up because of our government. Our society is screwed up because we're screwed up. The government is only a reflection of us. And we have forgotten who we truly are. By the way, that moth... Go to the dentist office. Fly, fly. So let me spend a couple of minutes telling you, reminding you of who we are. This is, this is, can I stand here? Can you see me in this light? Okay. No, trust me. That's, my wife would appreciate that. No, honey, I can't see you anymore. It's too dark in here. Come on. Um, sorry. 
That would be one of the things my wife would say. Why did you put that in? Um, this is, Rafe, could you just help me with these when, when I need them? You, I'll put, you pass them out. This is my son, Rafe, by the way. Um, it, was the, uh, it was the fall, or, I'm sorry, the spring of uh, 1860 up in Connecticut. And a lot of people that had just joined a new party had gotten together. And they were up in Connecticut and they were talking about this new candidate who didn't have a chance at all to win. The party was the grand old party. And the candidate was Abraham Lincoln. And all of the people at a gathering just like this one, all of them wore one of these. And what it is, is the all-seeing eye surrounded by the pillar of fire and smoke from the Bible. And it says now in faded writing, the Wide Awake Club. And what they were saying at the time was, everyone's asleep. It's time to wake them up. And they were proud not to be a Tea Party person, but to say, I am wide awake. That's who we need to be. We need to learn from the past. Our fellow citizens are dead asleep. It's time to say, I'm awake. And I'm awake enough to remember who we really are, not who we've allowed ourselves to become. This little box is something that used to be given to 12-year-olds. These 12-year-olds, I want to read this exactly. These 12-year-olds were, um, uh, were solicited on on broadsides that they would put up on the sides of, of barns and on telephone poles and everything else. I mean, not actually telephone poles, it was too soon before, but you get the idea. Um, back in the 1800s, they would put these banners up. And it was a wanted banner for people who wanted a job. And these said, wanted, young men, young, skinny, wiry, uh, preferably no older than 18, orphans preferred. Okay. Pony Express. They would have to get on their horse and they would do 250 miles a day on the horse. Every about 75 miles, they would stop. They wouldn't actually stop themselves. They would jump off one horse and jump on the other horse. 250 miles out into the west fighting the Indians. Your, your chance of survival was very, very low. Orphans preferred. But you got $25 a month. This only lasted about a year. But we did it for a year. And there were some amazing things that came out of it. First of all, the only thing you got when you, when you, joined, the, when you joined the Pony Express was this. A Bible. A Pony Express Bible that you could keep in your pack because you were headed for some trouble. So know what the truth is and keep it in your pack. The government issued you a Pony Express Bible to make sure that you would get there. And what was the character of these kids? They wanted you to be about 14 years old because you would be low to the horse. And so 14 years old, there was one kid, uh, his name was uh, Charlie, Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller is an amazing kid, 12 years old, 12. He lied to him, said he was 14. Charlie Miller was a small little wiry kid that just wanted to serve his country. And he went and he rode the Pony Express. He was one of the first, one of the last. Now this is in the 1800s. As he grows up, he starts to fight in the Indian Wars. And then he's in Wild West, the Wild West show with uh, Wild Bill. And he's doing all the Wild West shows. Now he's about 70 years old. And he's a legend in America. Nobody's ever heard of him now. But he was a legend in America. And he said one more time to his country, I want to serve. Because there was a war to end all wars that was starting. World War I. And our country looked at him and said, oh, uh, you're, you're too old. You're an old man, you can't go. He said, the hell I am. You can't serve. He said, you watch me. So he got onto a ship. He went over to England. 
And he said, will you take an American? They said, we'll take anybody. He served and survived in World War I. That's the kind of Americans we used to be that couldn't get enough service in the love for the love of their country. But we have lost those things. Because now all we're talking about is what do I get from my country? Not how can I serve my country and beyond that. I'm sorry, I know I'm in Texas and this is going to be unpopular. This is another thing my wife would say, you shouldn't have done that. The Pledge of Allegiance bothers me. Because I don't pledge allegiance to a flag. I pledge allegiance to the Republic. I pledge allegiance to the Constitution. I pledge allegiance to the principles that we all hold dear. And I know that's what that represents, but so many people don't anymore. They don't know what those principles are. And unless we continue, continually remind them, unless we tell our own story, Hollywood's not going to, Washington's not going to, the schools aren't going to, we need to teach our children these stories. We need to renew it in ourselves. There was a man that had a dream. You'll see on this, it says February 23rd, 1892. Man had a, had a dream. And he lived in a country where he could make his own way. Where he could be whatever he wanted to be. And he was a woodworker. But he didn't want to be a woodworker. He wanted to be a pharmacist. And so the last thing he did in woodworking was make this. And he started to make and grind his own medicine to make powders for people. Now, if he would have been a woodworker, or if he would have been a woodworker that wanted to make, uh, to be a pharmacist in any other country, the story would end right there in 1893. But everyone here has actually seen this mortar pestle before. Can anybody tell me why? This was made by Mr. Walgreen. In America, a man has a dream, and he makes it, and he follows his dream, and he makes it with his own spirit, his own fortitude, his own hands. That's why this is in the logo of Walgreens. Who are we as people? <laughs> this is the most bizarre piece of mail you'll ever see in your life. This was sent... And you can see on it, it, it was sent June 2nd, I can't read the date, and it, it's got a, letter to, got a letter to mom and dad here, it has a little drawing of a palm leaf, on this side it has a little drawing of the area, and what it says here is, dear mom and dad, I can't tell you all the news, but you want to save this coconut, because... I'm doing something with the United States Navy that nobody's ever done before, and you're going to read about it very soon, but save this coconut, because this is the last coconut from the Bikini Atolls. This was the last, he says, on this coconut that was sent through the mail. I grabbed this basically right before we blew it up, before we tested the hydrogen bomb. <clears throat> Who are we? We are people that put the Manhattan Project in. We were so far behind Germany. But we are a people that don't give up. We're a people that don't need direction from the top down. We do it bottom up. That's who we are. I'm going to show you something else. This is an amazing piece. This is an amazing piece that... Um, started in 19, 1953, November of 1953, two brothers, one had vision, one had the American dream in his heart, the other one was an accountant, the other one was a bean counter. The other one was just trying to say, stop, don't, 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 we'll lose the company, please don't, we can't do that. 
And he said, no, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, this is going to change the world. His brother wouldn't go along with it. He couldn't talk anybody into it. They all said it was madness. So he calls his secretary and an artist. And he said, I want you to come to my office this weekend. Don't tell anybody. Bring some pillows and some blankets because you're going to be here Friday night, Saturday night. And then I'm catching a plane to go to New York on Monday. And I need to have this presentation ready. So they spent the weekend. They spent the weekend. They spent the weekend. Hang on just a second. They spent the weekend writing this. And it says, Disneyland will be based upon and dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that created America. It will be a place uniquely equipped to dramatize these dreams and these facts and send them forth as a source of courage and inspiration to the rest of the world. In this, on the front page, it folds out, is something that looks a lot like this. It's the map of Disneyland. It was hand-colored by Walt himself. This was lost because what happened was Walt went to New York and he went to bank after bank after bank and all of them laughed at him. And then finally the last bank said, no, that's crazy. And he was so upset he left that at the bank. The father, the banker, he comes home to his children and he says, look kids, Walt Disney was in my office today asking for money. Look what he wants to do. The kids were wide-eyed. Dad, you gave him the money, didn't you? He said, no, it's nuts. He needed $17 million to build that. It's nuts. They put it away on a top shelf until about three years ago. The family was all dying out. And somebody, the last child, was going through the stuff in the closet and pulled that off the shelf and found it. By the way, this is how much we've changed. Walt couldn't get the money in 1953. In the fall of 1954, he convinced ABC Television, I'll give you a TV show, you finance this, I need $17 million. In November of 1954, they struck a deal. Tell me, Mr. Attorney General, how, how crazy would it be to do this? For me to come to you and say there's an orange grove, and I'm going to build this park, and I'm going to open it next summer. <laughs> I'm crazier than Louis Gomer. It was announced to his staff, November of 54, and the ribbon was cut July 1955. That's how far away from the American dream we have gone. This man, Walt Disney, is one of my, one, truly one of my heroes because nothing stopped him. As he's getting ready, as he's within a couple of years before he's dead, he has this feeling that everything in his life he's done is going to pale in comparison to the next 15 years. He had this idea that I'm going to make a man, I'm going to make a mechanical man walk. And I'm not going to make just any mechanical man walk. I need to find the perfect man because I need to tell the stories of inspiration to spread the American story all around the world. Well, this is happening in the 1962 World's Fair. And he can't get the mechanical man to walk. And the world is anticipating it. And the fair has now been open for two weeks. And he can't get this thing to walk. And he's got to set all the lights and everything else. So he makes a non-mechanical man just to run it all through the program to get the lights right. The man he picked to be the inspiration to the world was Abraham Lincoln. This is the original Abraham Lincoln head from the first... Abe Lincoln Speaks. 
Imagine, imagine what that was like at the time to see a man, mechanical, stand up, walk, and speak. Nobody had even dreamt that before. Now we think of Disney World, and we think of Disney World as a great place to go and vacation and to go see the mouse and the castle. This is the paper announcing the Florida Project. But if you look at the picture on the Florida Project, there's no castle there. Because that's not what Walt wanted to do. Walt actually had the right in California to his own nuclear power plant. Walt was going to build cities. Because he knew the city, he knew what was happening in the world wasn't working. And his dream was so big and so vast, he said, we're going to make EBCOT, Experimental Prototype City of Tomorrow, where we are going to test everything, new ways to get rid of garbage, new ways to recycle, new ways to fuel our cars, new ways to get around. And in 1960, we still had the right to dream that big. Now that's impossible because we have forgotten who we are, and we have forgotten that the Constitution was there to restrain the government, not to restrain us from dreaming and doing and changing the world, but to restrain the government from stopping us. Who are we? Raoul Wallenberg. Anybody know who Raoul Wallenberg is? Raoul Wallenberg. He was a Swedish diplomat. This is one of his passports that he made. He was in World War II. And he was a Swedish diplomat. He's one of my heroes. He saved thousands of Jews from the Holocaust. And he went, he was sent over from Sweden, and he was, he was uh, uh, sent right into the, the, the nastiest part of the war at the very end where they are just rounding everybody up. He got on his typewriter and he started making those which basically says you are no longer a Jew. You belong to Sweden. You belong to me. And he would print them up and he would go and he would stand on the top of the train as they put the Jews on the train cars. And he would stuff those inside the train car in between the crack and then he would stand on top of the train and he would say, stop, you have my people. And they would have to empty those trains. And as long as you had one, you were safe. Sweden gets the credit for Raoul Wallenberg. It was America that sent him. And it wasn't the government. The government was so wound up in its own tape and its own quite honestly, anti-Semitism, that it, could, it didn't do anything. They knew, but it didn't do anything. So it was private citizens who decided to do something. We sent Raoul Wallenberg. We led the way. Our government abandoned him. After the war was won, the Russians came in and he was last seen running into the arms of the Russians. And he said, they can't be as bad as the Nazis. He was told, get out, get out, get out, by Jews. That one was one of the last ones he gave out. And the woman said to him, get out. And he said, they can't be as bad as the Nazis, they'll help. I have a cigarette case that was carried by the first troops in one of the troops that he ran into the arms of, and on the cigarette case carved in it in, in Russian is, let's kill all the Jews and go home. It was a disease that what swept the world and all humanity. What kept us away from that were our principles and our understanding of who we are and that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain rights. And when a government which is established to protect those rights, when that government stops protecting those rights and starts to become an infringer of those rights, it is the people's right, it is their 
duty to shake off those chains. We feel small and insignificant because we've been told we are small and insignificant. You're not small and insignificant. The media today doesn't understand what the heck happened. What, what is this? Where, where, did, where did Ted Cruz come from? Where did Donald Trump come from? Where, where, where did Bernie Sanders come from? Spartacus. I don't know, the people? Spartacus. <laughs> Came from the people. People on both sides that are tired of being lied to. We are not stupid. We are the people that changed the world. Anybody see the movie Stalag 18? Remember the movie Stalag 18? Um, in this movie Stalag 18, it, it's it's basically Hogan's Heroes without Schultz, uh, and and it, it's the Great Escape. And these guys, what they went through was amazing to get out of this concentration camp. And I've watched this movie a couple of times, and and in the movie, uh, they are, they are trying to keep all of their plans secret and away from the guards and they don't want to get caught, but they have to have a map, and they have to be able to figure out where are the train yards, you know, where do we go? And so they're all sitting around, they're trying to remember where everything is, and they, and they draw this map. And in the movie, somebody comes and comes to the, by the door, and they're like, guard! And so they take the map, and they put it up on the piano, and I always thought, like, they have a piano, please. <laughs> but they hit it behind the music. That's the movie. This is the actual map that they, that they drew as they were in the concentration camp. What's fascinating and tremendous about this map is what's on the back. Who are we? We're people that can remember a map. We're people that can, we can, we can do things if we have a map. But that one was an allied victory. That one was a bunch of allies getting together. I want to show you another map, because this is really who we are. Louis, would you actually hold this one for me? Let me take this, open this here, and then hold this, hold that up, hold it on the plastic here, yeah. Come on up here. This, is the actual lunar landing map signed by the pilot of Apollo 12. What's amazing about this is this is what they use to land on the moon. And you see here, all around the craters, if you could get close to it, you would see it's each little crater has an X or an O. Now, I'm not sure what, what one, what, what, which one represented, give it a whirl. And which one represented, holy crap. <laughs> but I'm guessing that's what it is. And you had to be within this ellipse here to be able to land. Land somewhere there on an X or an O. But this is the map from Apollo 12. And if you look at this map closely, you will see that it is made up of several lines and several boxes. These are all pictures, one by one, taken and strung together. Who took that? Well, Neil Armstrong was saying one giant, uh, one small step, one giant leap for mankind. There was another man up in the capsule that was going around the moon taking pictures so this map could be made. So now, what does that tell you? That tells you that we're people that go places and we don't have a map. We're explorers who are brave enough for the love and the joy of exploration and doing things that nobody's ever done. We don't wait for a permit. We don't wait for, you know, let me tell you something. I came from New York. It took me a year and a half to build radio, one radio studio, a year and a half in New York City. I come to Texas. I buy the studios of Las Colinas. I have to update all three control rooms, put all digital uh, high-definition equipment in. 
We changed uh, the landscape of it. We tore out walls. We rewired the whole thing. I had the studios up and running in six weeks. God bless the state of Texas. I'll leave you with two, two other stories, and then thank God you can go home. But those chairs are comfy, aren't they? This is part of a collection that is truly remarkable. This is something that was handed to one of my staff members in an old shoebox. And it sat in my office for about two months and things were stacked up on top of that shoebox. Somebody came in and said, Glenn, I think you need to look at this shoebox. And I said, great, just put it on the back for me. It took me a couple months to get around to it. And I opened it up and I got onto the phone and the page, I paged the building, I said, whoever brought me a shoebox two months ago, can you come to my office? I said, who gave this to us? They said, it was a girl in her 30s. And her mother and the family went to Restoring Honor in Washington, D.C. and stood on the mall with us there at the feet of the Lincoln Memorial about, what, six years ago. And they were in the, longer than that, eight, eight years. Okay. Okay, don't make me feel that old. Anyway. Um, they stood in the back, and the mother said, an older woman, he's just like your dad. He needs to have your dad's stuff because he'll appreciate it, he'll care for it, he'll make sure it's never lost, and he'll share it with people. In the shoebox were all of this man's medals, and his writings. This is on the back of an open cigarette package. The back of it is, talks about you know, the cigarette brand. And I don't read Vietnamese, so I didn't know what it was at first. I have a stack of them about that big. And the first part of the stack is how to wire a house how does the human reproductive system work? All of these amazing things. How, how do we, um, how, how does a rocket work? All of these things that are just basic. He wrote them because they were everything that he had learned and he was afraid he was going to lose himself and he wanted to be able to put all of his information back into his head when his nightmare was over. The other parts are how he's afraid of an end of his persecution. He was in the Hanoi Hilton. Do you remember the guy who was so brilliant that sent a tape and he blinked? SOS, I'm being tortured. Remember him? That's him. And in it, he talks about how I'm afraid to come back home because I have to forgive everyone for going on with their life. It was right. They had to, and I would have told them to, but now I know I'm going to get back, and I'm going to feel bad. And I thought, as I'm reading that one, I'm thinking, wow, look at this turmoil and how angry he must have been. And then, and then he turns a corner where he starts to say, I have to forgive my captors. I have to forgive the men who are pulling my arms out of my sockets, quote, because I don't know what has happened in their life. I don't know how they got to be that person. And it's not about them, it's about me. It's not what they're doing to me, it's how I deal with it. That's what makes me a man. He wrote, don't dread suffering. That will only make it worse. Anticipate it, predict it, even exaggerate it in your anticipation of it. Don't fight a neurosis or a symptom of one. It may be a friend in disguise, a mere symptom of a deeper disturbance rendered less severe by it. A neurosis may actually be a, a, a vital protective shield 
Detach yourself from it. Predict it. Exaggerate it. Laugh at it. It can safely and effectively be ridiculed away, but not torn away. To find meaning in every circumstance, and meaning varies for the individual and every circumstance, and in that circumstance and with that individual, it may even vary by the hour. But the meaning for a particular moment may simply be to endure that moment in a matter that you can be proud of. But be aware of false pride. I don't expect too much. Perhaps in retrospect it will show that it was meaningful just enough to have endured, to have survived, to have tried. Perhaps in the end it is just as meaningful to look back and say, I tried, as it would be to say, I succeeded. Who are we as people? Who are we as Americans? I testify to you that this is who we are. We just have to be reminded of that. Last story. Because the republic is at stake. And take care of the state of Texas. Because Texas may be the, may be the Alamo. Yep. Yeah. Where else were people run? And on that note, I am for building a border fence. I would just like a fence on the northern and the western border first. I said to Rick Perry when I first moved down, he didn't catch it at first. I moved down here and like two weeks into it, I said, Governor, we gotta get a northern border. We gotta stop all these New Yorkers from coming down here. My son was born in Texas. And we all say, we all say that we're Texans. And, and he's, he was like five and he's like, no, you're not. I'm a Texan, you're not. But the Republic is at stake and you know it. And now is not the time, now is not the time to question what we should have done, could have done, where we messed up, where we succeeded. It's not a chance, it's not a place to doubt ourselves. It is a place to reestablish in ourselves that, that feeling that we first had when we first started doing the Tea Party, when we first started coming together saying, they are going to listen to us. They have spent the last eight years trying to tell you, we're not listening, we're not listening. Doesn't matter what they do, this is about us. And perhaps, Perhaps in the end it will be best or meaningful enough to say we tried then we succeeded and here's why I am I am a very religious man. I I believe in the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob I believe that this country was divinely inspired. I believe God has a purpose for this nation and beyond this nation these rights that he has asked each of us to protect and defend. He hasn't given us these rights so we can go build an amusement park. He has given us these rights so we can protect them for future generations so his people will have the rights and the power to respond to him when his work needs to be done. And so when we are all called home, believe me, the Lord is going to ask us, oh yeah, I remember you. I sent you to America when rights were being lost. What was it you were too busy doing again? I cannot face my maker with that. And I'm telling you, I truly believe the Lord is taking a tally right now. Have you ever seen an election like this? You read the scriptures and they cry out for a king. And God says, you don't want a king. And the people cried out for a king. You don't want a king. And they cried out for a king. Okay, you can have your king. The people now are crying out for a king. On both the left and the right. I just want to win. I don't care about the Constitution. I want somebody just to get it done. Go, Ted. What do we get? <laughs> Amen. What do we get without our principles? 
Without our principles, we cannot become the thing that we have despised. We cannot play the same game, have trust in the Almighty that He has our back. But have you ever seen, ever seen an election like this? Usually it's over by Florida. But it is almost like God is saying, no, I want every single person in every single state on record. All the way, state by state, from Iowa to California. I want each one of you to stand up and say, I'm for good or I'm for evil. I choose God and his principles, and I don't care what happens. I'm, not, I'm leaving the outcome to you, Lord. I am leaving it in your hands. I will stand on the sacred principles enshrined in our Constitution, and no man will shake me from that. Because the Lord is going to look you in the eye and ask you, and there's no lying, because he's writing it down in a book. And everyone is being held accountable. So what do we have to do? 1961, John F. Kennedy meets with Khrushchev, and it doesn't go well. And the world is on the brink. This is right before the, the missile crisis. The world is on the brink. We're about to vaporize each other. And John F. Kennedy decides to go over and meet with Khrushchev, but all of the Kennedy advisors say, you don't want to go over there, you're out of your league, kid. And he's like, I'm a Kennedy. You're out of your league. You have to have more time on the job. Please don't go over now. I'm going to meet with him. You're going to humiliate us and yourself. He went over, and Khrushchev ate him for breakfast. And he humiliated himself, and he humiliated the country. He gets back on Air Force One. He didn't know what to say. How am I going to go back and explain to the American people, I didn't listen to my advisors, I've humiliated our country, and I've humiliated, I've lost it. I made a huge error. What do I say? So he goes into his cabin on Air Force One, about halfway across the Atlantic. Evelyn Lincoln, his secretary, is on board, and he buzzes her. He says, Evelyn, please come in to the office and take away all the papers and throw them away. He had been in trying to write a speech, trying to explain, trying to reason with himself, where do I go from here? She comes in and she said that his head was down on the desk, and his hands were on his head, and she didn't, he didn't move when she walked in, and she didn't say anything. He had just pushed all of the papers onto the floor. So she quietly, on Air Force One, picked up all of the papers and threw them all away, except for one, because she thought this one was important. And in her handwriting here at the top, she just wrote notes, June 1961. This is JFK's handwriting. And he writes, I know there is a God. I see a storm coming. If he has a place for me, I am. And then he scratches out, I am. And he writes, I believe I am ready. I want to leave you with this. This is a divine place. America, we have nothing to apologize for. We're an exceptional nation. And beyond that, this is an exceptional state. It is the last outpost of freedom in America. And I know we're all tired. And I do this for a living. You, you two do it too. I have to actually tell everybody about all of it every day. I've tried to wake America up. There's a lot of our brothers and sisters that are just not going to, they're dead asleep. They cannot pin that button on their, on their chest that says wide awake. There are very few that can. I don't know what we could have done to wake them up, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we continue to do. We continue to stand. 
we continue to try to give it all, to pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. It is our sacred duty and responsibility to stop arguing about our rights and start listening to our own responsibilities and stand. Because I testify to you again, I see a storm coming. I know there is a God. And each of us need to tonight and our drive home answer the question, do you write, I am, or do you write, I believe, I am ready. God bless you. Thank you.